I do have a superhero question, and, and, it just, and it's a superhero is in the classroom. Can you tell us a little bit about how you use some of the superhero problems um, that you talked about in your talk today to get students interested in science and posing scientific questions? Uh, there's some of our introductory physics classes where we use examples from movies or comic books. Just something a little different, a little interesting to think about. And sometimes it's because they get the science right, and sometimes it's because they get the science wrong. But either way, you get a, a learning moment. Uh, there are some examples I didn't talk about, for instance, that play into very fundamental physics. Uh, for instance, there's a character Magneto. The Marvel Universe can manipulate magnetic fields. <coughs> Very fundamental to electromagnetism is that electricity and magnetism are aspects of the same force. And moving magnetic fields generate electricity. So really, Magneto ought to be able to do a lot more with lightning and electrical <laughs> flow. And, and likewise, a, a character like Electro, who manipulates electric fields, ought to be generate magnetic fields when uh, they move or manipulate those electric fields. So light itself is electromagnetism, uh, oscillating electrical and magnetic waves. And so in the comic books, they, they sort of separate magnetism and electricity in the classroom. You can bring them together and uh, use that as an example. And, and basic mechanics, you're always seeing things in superhero movies or comic books that are kind of extreme and I think it's a little bit more interesting instead of throwing a rock off of a cliff and calculating where it lands uh, if the Hulk's throwing a tank. <laughs> I'm a little bit more engaged with that and uh, you know because you could make the physics problem as abstract and boring as possible and there'd be some fraction of science students who would be just fine with that. Uh, but I always like to jazz things up a little, and it made it more interesting to me thinking about these problems uh, that way. So, and we've got decades of stories uh, with lots of examples to pull out there. And when I pull examples from things, I use science fiction movies too, not just comic books, and try to do a little bit of everything to bring in different audiences. Well, and in fact, this is one of the places where I think a humanities council or a humanities focused event links up with what happens in science. We were talking earlier about how science is a way to explain your world, but also stories is a way to explain your world. And, and I'm always impressed when I talk to scientists about how big a role stories play, and that's in the purview of the humanities, right? How big a role stories play in helping us understand the world and helping us contextualize the scientific facts that understand the world. So whatever stories you tell in your classroom is going to is going to jazz your students and predispose them in different ways. I, I really think important. it's very natural for humans to learn uh, from narrative. And anytime you can cast your lesson in the form of a narrative, I think it tends to stick better than if it's just in the most abstract sense. Uh, and that, that's risky too, because narrative can be really powerful and misleading. Yes. So I think there are a lot, of, a lot of ways to jazz up the science without changing or distracting. Uh, from the science itself. Uh, we've, we've had some examples here discussed as anecdote. Anecdotes are not science. The anecdotes can be very compelling stories, yes. and if they reflect the right underlying reality, incredibly effective. If they reflect a false reality, then they can be very damaging. Uh, I remember, just as one example, with seatbelts, there were a lot of people who didn't want to wear their seatbelts because they heard a story about somebody being thrown free from the car wreck, and if they had been strapped in, they would have died. But statistically, people are safer to wear the seatbelts. So the one anecdote of somebody who was thrown free from the car and survived is a bad story to tell. It's not representative of, of the reality, even though it's a valid story on its own. So I'm pretty safe talking about superheroes, and <laughs> that I'm telling a story that, that uh, may illustrate a physical principle without necessarily being something that you're going to carry with you and say, well, I saw Spider-Man do this. <laughs> and this is a problem. Besides yourself, who would you consider a good science fiction writer? Uh, Arthur C. Clarke uh, wrote a few really fantastic books. Uh, Running with Rama, Fountains of Paradise. I think the ones that I think back on and remember fondly for expanding my mind about possibilities in the universe. Um, Joe Haldeman, I think, is a really excellent science fiction writer. Uh, Dan Simmons, 
uh, was just done in Colorado as another one. Those are three I'd recommend highly. And there's more, uh, Connie Willis, Nancy Press, uh, David Brin, Gregory Beckford. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of really great writers out there. And it's, it's nice because there's always another good book to read. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And we will be back in Gillette. And I hope we'll see you all here and come and see us when you are down in Laramie. Thank you all very much.